Welcome to CBS Radio Mystery Theater Archives, the only YouTube channel which has the original classic episodes of the CBS Radio Mystery Theater in order with no ads. Thank you for listening, and now, enjoy the show. Why does a mother awake the instant before her child starts to cry? Why do lovers anticipate each other's wants? Why, for that matter, does a family dog raise his head and growl a warning when a stranger approaches noiselessly in the dead of night? No one knows precisely why. Lacking a better explanation, we call it something in the air. Max? Are you there? Max! You don't open the store. I'm, I'm going to call the police. No. They'll break it down. No! Go away! <laughs> mystery drama, Something in the Air, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elspeth Eric and stars Gordon Heath. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. This is a love story. It's about love, about lovers, about loving. Do not expect that we will define or explain Love, lovers, or loving. No one can do that. But at least we can present for your consideration some of the aspects of love, some of the obsessions of lovers, and some of the strange manifestations of loving. Max? Max, are you there? It's Hester. I haven't seen you for a whole month, and, and neither has anyone else, or heard from you. Well, we've all called, and you won't answer the phone. So do you think that's right, to worry your friends that way? And me? I'm a little bit more than a friend, wouldn't you say? But do you think it's right to upset me like this? Max, please. I love you, Max. Doesn't that mean anything to you? Max! Damn it! Answer me! Max, if you don't open the store, I'll, I'll get the police and have them break it down. You hear me? I'll get the police. No. No. I will. I swear I will. Don't do that, Hester. Well, then let me in. Open the store and let me in. Go away, Hester. How can I go away when I love you? How can I go away until I know you're all right? Go away, Esther. All right, Max. I'll go away. But first, I want to tell you something. I've sent a cable to your daughter. Did you hear me, Max? I cabled Nina yesterday. You had no right to do I that. I had to do it, Max. I sent a cable to Barbados. The cruise ship stopped there for two days. She's probably on her way back right now. You have no right. She'll get in sometime today. No. And when she gets here back, she'll come right to the house. No. And when she does, you let her in. You hear me? You let her in. I'm leaving now, Max. I won't bother you again. But when your daughter shows up at this door, you let her in. That was a year ago. I'm Max Avery. Uh, perhaps you've heard of me. Max Avery, the great modern painter. Esther was my model during one of my more fertile periods. Then she became my mistress. 
And that relationship had gone on for oh, five or six years. I, I never wanted to marry after my wife died, but the liaison with Hester had been very satisfactory. Now she had violated every tenet of our understanding. She had intruded herself, her judgment, into my intensely private life. And more than that, she had involved my daughter, my lovely 18-year-old daughter, Nina, who at any moment might arrive at my front door. Nina. Is that you, darling? Forgive me, sweetheart, if I don't come to the door, I... I've not been well, you see. Darling, perhaps in a day or two, next next week. I'm so sorry Hester sent you that cable. What did she say, that I, that I was ill or something? Well, it's nothing serious. Love, really, nothing serious. Oh, darling, please. Darling. Oh, oh Nina, wait, wait, sweetheart. I, I'll open it. Just, just wait. Nina, what? Uh, Max. What? Uh, who? Nina? <laughs> no, it's not Nina, Max. <laughs> Were you expecting Nina? Yes. Max, what's wrong? Don't you recognize me? Dan Fogarty. Dan. That's right. From the old days in the village? Dan... Fogarty. Max, uh, let me in, will you? Please, I, I wish you would. I... I thought you were... Nina. Max, uh, what have you been doing to yourself? Doing? Nothing. Oh, don't tell me nothing. Granted, I haven't seen you for a year or more, but... Uh, well, nobody could change so much in a year. I've changed. Have you looked at yourself lately? Not for a while. Not since when? Since about a month ago. Well, don't you care how you look? How do I look? Like, um, like a ghost. That, that. Look, would you care for a drink, Daniel? Well, for old time's sake, sure. <laughs> if you'll have one with me. Uh, for old time's sake. A glass of old Madeira wine, for old times' sake. There you are. Two old times. Two. Uh. Oh, Max. Max, for heaven's sake. Max. Max, what is it? I'm all right. Well, I thought for a moment you'd fainted. You just toppled over. Here, here let me help you up. Here. That's it. No, 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 sit down. You all right? All right. Well, you must be sick. Not sick. Well, why would you fall down like that if you're not sick? I've been fasting. You've been fasting? No food at all? Just water. Well, how long has this been going on? I think... I think for about a month. Yes. For a month. Dan Fogarty was... Kindness itself helped me upstairs into bed. Went down to the kitchen, heated a can of beef broth, and brought it up to me. Perhaps you're wondering who is Daniel Fogarty and how did he wander into my life at this particular point in time? Well, Dan's a painter like myself. Talented, I've always thought, but unlike me, uh, He's never achieved any success whatsoever. Max, a month without food. So when are you functioning at all? Why'd you do it? I was uh, desperate. You of all people, Daniel, you, you'll understand this. I dried up, went stale. I can't paint a thing that isn't a repetition of something I've done before. Ever run into a snag like that? Huh. Who hasn't? I've tried everything, even tried the geography cure. Went to Kyushu. Where's that? Island south of Japan, between the Pacific and the East China Sea. That that sort of thing's worked for me before. You remember? Ten years ago, when I'd gone dead, 
stale, flat, and unprofitable. Took Nina with me. She had a wonderful time. I damn near died. I did die. I kept turning out the same old stuff, dry, boring, rehash of everything I'd done before. It was hell. Oh, I can imagine. Well, how is Nina, by the way? All right, I guess. I haven't seen her since she was, uh, oh, 10 or 12, I guess. Uh, she's a big girl now. You'd hardly recognize her. She is so beautiful. She's the light of my life, you might say, my, my reason for being. Especially now that I can't paint anymore. Oh, come on. It'll come back. It's bound to. Maybe. Maybe it will. Give it time. When I decided to, to go on my fast, I sent Nina on a cruise to the Caribbean. I couldn't have her around you. You know, she'd have interfered. Well, sure. She's due back, matter of fact. When you rang the bell, I thought it was Nina. Yes, I know you did. See, Hester was here before. You remember Hester? The gorgeous redhead. Uh, she was your model, wasn't she? The last few years, she's been my paramour, you might say. Ah. Esther's been trying to bust in here, find out why I was holed up. I wouldn't let her in, wouldn't answer the phone. Just before you showed up, she was banging on the door, threatening to call the police. And finally, she told me she'd sent a wire to Nina in Barbados. And I should expect my daughter to show up any minute. So when the bell rang, I thought, of course, it was Nina. Even after I saw it wasn't, I didn't know who it was. Well, what were you doing there? On my doorstep? Why? Why today? Why at that precise moment? Why haven't you called me before or come to see me? Oh, I don't know. You're a big man. Important painter. We don't travel in the same circles. You live in this big old townhouse. I live over at Chinese Laundry on East 14th Street. You eat in all the big restaurants. I still take my meals in Joe's Beanery. <laughs> well, there's no reason, really, why I should look you up. Or you may. But you looked me up tonight. Why? Why did you? I... I just did. No, no, no particular reason. Anybody tell you anything about me? Hester? Any of the old gang? Oh, I haven't seen Hester in years. Or the old gang either. And why did you show up when you did? I don't know, Max. You came all the way over here from East 14th Street to see me. And you don't know why? I really don't, Max. That's crazy. Crazy. That's your doorbell. Want me to answer it? Would you? It must be Nina. Oh, sure. You stay right there. I'll let her in. I'll uh, tell her you're a trifle indisposed. He is. Tell her that. I lay in bed, staring at the ceiling, pondering what Daniel had just said. From downstairs, I could hear the door open. I could hear voices. You're uh, Nina. I'm uh, Daniel Fogarty. Oh. Your father's not feeling quite up to uh, par. I'm an old friend. I've been sort of taking care of him. Oh, I see. I don't uh, suppose uh, you remember me. I think I do. Well, I remember you when you, you were a little girl. Uh, why don't I come inside? Oh, uh, oh yes. Why don't you? Come in. <laughs> come in. I was growing impatient. What was going on downstairs? Why didn't Daniel bring my daughter up to see me? What were they doing? What were they saying? I got heavily out of bed and walked out into the hall to the head of the stairs. When I leaned over the banister, I could see them. His head was bent over hers. She was looking up into his face. Their voices were low and... and tender. I could feel, yes, from where I stood, I could feel the tenderness. Yes, feel it in the air. The tenderness 
and the love. You think such things don't happen? That a man and a woman meet, speak, and touch, or do not touch, and love is born between them? Of course it happens. Not often, perhaps, but it happens. But how often is it that a third person, observing but unobserved, with no forethought of ever witnessing such a thing, suddenly knows with certainty that it has happened, that the man and the woman he gazes upon have, on the instant, fallen in love. We will return shortly with Act Two. It's an oddly, if not ill-matched couple that stands at the front entrance to Max Avery's house. The exquisite young girl, elegantly dressed, and the slightly unkempt and very shabby man, definitely in his middle years. Yet something in the air tells Max Avery, standing at the top of the stairs and looking down at the incongruous couple, that these two have simultaneously and instantly fallen in love. I knew it. I knew it. Within the few minutes since Nina had rung the doorbell to my house and Daniel Fogarty had admitted her, the most powerful experience that can befall a human being had transpired. From where I stood, still trembling from the weakness brought on by my month of fasting, I gazed down upon them. Both horror and rage swept through my body, and the next day I sought out the only person I could confide in, Esther. But how can you know, Max? How can you be so sure? I know, I know. And when they came up to your bedroom... How was it then? Oh, they were conventional. They dissembled. Nina was solicitous about my health. Daniel reassured her that I'd be up and about in a few days. And you were? We spoke briefly of my work. There wasn't much to say about that. I asked about her Caribbean cruise. She went into detail about that. Daniel spoke of olden times when he and I were young, struggling artists, how we had drifted apart until he passed my house and had the sudden impulse to ring the bell. Max, what about his impulse? Have you thought about that? It was an impulse. What is there to think about? Perhaps something told him that you needed him. Something in the air. I wish to God he'd stayed away. Max, you don't mean I that. I do. I do mean it. With all my heart. Look what his meddling has led to. My daughter loves him and he loves her. You don't know that. I do know it. As sure as you and I are sitting here, I know it. Don't argue with me, Hester. I know it. All right. We won't argue. But if you are right, there's only one explanation. And what might that be? You are clairvoyant. Clairvoyant? You have second sight. That's utter nonsense. That's balderdash. I'm not clairvoyant. I don't have second sight. I don't believe in those things. Then how did you know? What, what you say you knew. I mean, with no real evidence. I knew because I knew. Because I... Because I loved my daughter... What concerns her concerns me. What touches her touches me. They do say that clairvoyance is often limited to a single fleeting vision. Provided, of course, uh, there's a personal element involved. Such as what? Well, such as uh, danger to someone much beloved. That's it. That's it. I saw danger. Nina's in danger if she loves this man, if he loves her. Well, why is it dangerous? Hester... Nina is 18, on the brink of womanhood. Daniel is my age. She's the daughter of a successful artist she's received everywhere along with me. Received, accepted, and welcomed. 
He is nothing, a nothing who goes nowhere, is accepted nowhere, welcomed nowhere. To bind herself to him, to sink down to his low level of existence, it's unbearable, it's unthinkable, it's got to be stopped. How was I to stop this burgeoning love affair? I had no idea. But days passed, and I grew even more certain of what had been certain from the first. Strange things began to happen, and my horror grew. Marvelous dinner, Nina. You make it all yourself? All but the dessert. I bought that. <laughs> Damn good. Whole thing. Seen Daniel lately? This morning. Where are you going? I'm going to answer the phone. The phone didn't ring. It's Daniel. How do you know? Hello, Daniel. Things like that. They drove me wild. It's like the night... There was a knock at the door. Want me to see who's at the door? You might as well. It's probably Dan Fogarty. I don't think so. He usually stops by about this time. Not tonight. Well, see who it is. Probably someone to see you. Hello. Hello, Hester. Come on in. She seemed always to know where he was and what he was doing. How he was feeling, how his work was progressing or not progressing. When he would call or come to the house, when he was thinking of her, when his mind was on other things. I never felt free to accuse her of this obsessive preoccupation with Dan Fogarty. For I dared not tell her that I knew, that I had known from their first meeting, and that the two of them were in love. Until one night, she and I were alone after dinner. And, uh, where's Daniel this evening? No phone call, no knock at the door. You think he's forgotten you? Oh, no. And then where is he? He's looking for a job. Job, you said. We need money. We? You said we need money. Yes. Not he needs money, we need money. I'm going to live with him, Father. What? You are What? Daniel and I are going to live together. No, you are not. You are not going to live with that man. Yes, Father, I am. I think he'll find a job very soon. I won't let you leave this house. You understand? My suitcase is all packed. It's in the hall closet. As soon as Daniel is sure of a job, I'm leaving. Perhaps tonight. You don't know what you're saying. No. Yes. Now. What are you doing? Where are you going? Daniel's found work. I'm going to him. How do you know? How can you know? Why, I just know. And it was true. She did know. At the very moment she spoke... Daniel had signed on as a bartender at one of the village pubs. Nina took her suitcase from the hall closet and left my house. And me. It would seem that you're not the only one who's clairvoyant, Matt. What am I to do, Hester? Let them live. Let them be happy. How long can she be happy with that nondescript little man? Oh, I've seen some of his paintings. They're not at all bad. He's 50 years old, maybe older. What can happen to him? Well, success came early to you, Max. Perhaps it will come late to him. Esther, let's not argue about this. I have to get her back. Get her back? But she won't come back. Then I'll abduct her. Abduct her? Are you mad? I don't know. It doesn't matter. I shall abduct her and bring her back. I forced Hester to join me in my plan to kidnap my daughter. She and I would drive together in my car to the dismal place where Dan Fogarty lived. 
We would park the car in front. We would wait there till we saw Nina approach. Then Hester would slip behind the wheel of the car, and I... I would seize my daughter and drag her into the automobile. The very next night, Hester and I sat in the darkened car and waited. Suppose she screams. Suppose she does, no matter. Well, what about the police? It'll be over and we'll have driven away before any police can get there. The police don't look kindly on kidnappings, even by father. She's my child. Max, she's 18. Even so. Well, what do you propose to do with her once you've got her home? I hadn't thought about that. Wait. Here she comes. Yes, it's Nina. Now, after I get out, you open the rear door, and when I've got her, I'll put her in the back seat. Max, I wish... All right. Nina. <laughs> it's all right. Father. It's all right. Here's the car. Get in. In there. It's all right. Don't be frightened. Now get in with you. Don't, don't be frightened. That's it. Let's just start the car. Nina, forgive me. I, I, I had to. Don't be frightened. I'm not frightened. It's just that I love you so much. I know. I can't let you waste yourself on that man. I know you think you love him, but you have to trust me, my darling, to know what's best. Oh, Father. You stay home with me. Perhaps I'll start to paint again. We'll, we'll, we'll have parties at the house. Ask lots of people. Wonderful people. You will meet a young man, one with prospects. A man your own age that you can be happy with. You, you see, darling. You, you see how it will be. I see very clearly how it will be, Father. We'll have good times. Lots of good times. We're there, Master. Oh. Oh, oh yes, uh, Nina. We're home. Uh, let me help you out, sweetheart. That's it. Oh, my darling, I'm so glad to have you home with me. Let's go inside. Father, it's no use. But we're here, sweetheart. We're home. Come inside with me. Matt? Look there. Behind you. What? Where? But by the steps. Hello, Max. Daniel. Is it you? Nina, is that Daniel? Of course. I knew he'd be here. How did you know? Why, I just knew. So we return to the simple statement. I knew. I just knew. Perhaps it sounds too simple. Almost foolish. Almost fatuous. I just knew. It indicates that you had no clear reason to know. No proof that you knew. No real excuse for knowing. Yet isn't it the most profound things of your life? The most significant? Aren't these the things that, without proof, with no excuse... And for no reason, you simply knew. We'll return shortly with our final act. Desperate in his desire to separate his daughter, Nina, from the man she so obviously desires, Max Avery has resorted to abduction. Only to find, when he forcibly returns the girl to his own home, that her lover is awaiting her there. As our last act ended, we heard... Max? Look there. Behind you. Where? By the steps. Hello, Max. Daniel. Nina? Is that Daniel? I knew he'd be here. How did you know? Why, I just knew... Max, give up. Why don't you? I can't do that. Take Nina into the house. Take her upstairs. Nina, go with Hester. Please, my darling. Let me talk to Dan. Will you do that for me? Come on, Nina. Let's go inside. All right. When I talk to Daniel, I'll be up to see you. All right, Father. You want to come in the house, Dan? We can talk here. Let's sit in the car. All right. Uh, get in. I'm after you. 
I won't run away. All right. Uh, Dan, it uh, must be pretty clear to you what I did. What's not clear is why you did it. I love your daughter, Max. You think you do. And she thinks she loves you. Dan, I can speak frankly to you, can't I? I think it better. I've known you two were in love with each other right from the start. And I just can't have that, Dan. No? After all... Well, after all, I'm a failure. I'm poor, I'm without influence, position, prospects. Not without talent, I hope. Well... And I'm no longer young. You do understand. I knew you would. Well, of course I understand. Only... Only what's to be done about it? I thought if I could get Nina away from you for a while, keep her away from you by force if necessary, see to it that she met some people, a lot of people, a lot of men. Young men with prospects. I got the idea of kidnapping her. I knew it was wild and desperate, but Dan, I was wild and desperate. I can understand that. Hester tried to talk me out of it, but I had to do it. And it might have worked. But when we pulled up here in front of the house and found you standing there, I knew it wasn't enough. No, it's not enough. How in the name of heaven did you get there? What possessed you to come to my house instead of going home? I don't know. But you must know. I was on my way home. I knew she'd be waiting for me, and then... Uh... Well, then my feet simply took me to your house. That's all. Dan, will you leave town? Leave town? Why should I leave town? I know you want to be fair to Nina. Of course I do. I know you don't blame me for trying to find a more suitable man for her. No, I don't blame you. And listen, will you go away for, say, six months? And swear to me you won't write to Nina or phone her. Where would I go? I have a little shack down on the Jersey Shore. I've had it for 30 years. Lived in it all one year when I first started to paint. First picture I ever sold, I painted there. Oh, yes. I remember that shack. That's right. I've held on to the place for a sentimental reason. I don't even know what kind of shape it's in. I haven't seen it since I took Esther there one day when we were getting acquainted. Nina doesn't even know I own the place. Here's the keys. I've carried them all these years. Sort of a good luck charm. If you... If you take the keys and take the car and go down there... Would you, Dan? Would you do that? And stay six months. You'll be on the ocean. You can paint. Six months in communicado. Will you do it, Dan? Will you? Dan nodded without speaking. I gave him the keys to the shack. We shook hands. I trusted him. I got out of the car. I stood on the sidewalk and watched him drive away. Then I turned and walked into the house. I trusted him to do exactly as I had requested him. Go to the Jersey Shore, hole up in my old shack and stay there for six months without making any effort to contact my daughter. Now, all I had to do was somehow to explain what I'd done to Nina. I dreaded it. But when I told her, she was amazingly calm, even receptive. He's gone away, my dear, to a place you know nothing about or one you've never seen, I even heard about. I understand. It's for six months, my love. Surely you can be separated from him for six months. Of course. He'll be perfectly safe where he is and comfortable enough, and he'll be able to paint. He's there. What? He's there. He's arrived. Where? Arrived where? Wherever you sent him. He's there, and he's unpacking his easel, and his paints and brushes. 
Almost immediately, I began to worry that the two of them would somehow communicate. That my drastic actions had accomplished nothing. That I could in no way prevent these two from reaching each other. What had been true the first time I saw them together at the door of my house was still true. There was something in the air. That something was love. Weeks passed and Nina seemed calm and content. One morning at breakfast... You look very pretty this morning, Nina. Do I really? You look pleased about something. I am pleased about something. Daniel has started to paint again. How would you know that? What? I just know. And a few weeks after that, again at the breakfast table, with creeping fear in my heart, I saw that Nina looked not only calm, content, and pleased with life, but radiant, exuberant. Dan has just finished a new picture. A beautiful picture. A great picture. He's very happy about it. And so am I. I was mad with rage and frustration. There seemed to be nothing, nothing in this world that I could do to save my child from this man. Only half sensing what my intentions were, I rented a car and started to drive to the shore. Once there, what would I say? I said it all, and nothing. Nothing had changed. Yet I must do something. Yes, do something. What? cold, paralyzing fear seized my heart and squeezed it. For I knew what I meant to do. I meant to kill him. I left the car on the road and walked down to the beach. I could see Dan Fogarty. He had just finished work for the day. He was packing up his paraphernalia, giving a last look at the painting he'd been working on. Then picked it up and started to walk to the shack. I gave him five minutes or more after he went inside. Then, drawing a long breath, I started down the beach, stopped the door to the shack, and entered without knocking. Well, Max, what well, how wonderful to see you. Come on in, sit down. Thank you. Here, sit here. I was just going to have a glass of wine. You'll join me? Thank you. I've been having a glass of wine every day after work. It's the salt air, I think. Here you are. You won't mind drinking out of old jelly glasses? We've both done it before, haven't we? <laughs> All right. Now, how about a toast? To your very good health. No, that won't do. To Nina? That won't do either. Well, then to what? To art. To murder. To... Did you say murder? I'm here to kill you, Dad. Oh, now, Max. You've been in touch with my daughter. Max, I haven't. I haven't phoned. I haven't written. But you've been in touch with her. She knows all about she you. She doesn't even know where I am. She knows you've been painting. Well, I'm always painting. She says you've just finished a very great painting. Well... That would be the one on the easel there. <laughs> you, you want to look at it? No. No! Uh, uh, Max! Uh, Max! Mother uh, uh, heaven, what are you I'm going to kill you? Oh, Max! Max, don't! I'm no. going to choke the breath out of your body, you. Max! No! No! Max! What are you doing? No! Uh, Let go of him! Take your hands off his throat! Max! I. Uh, Killed him. Oh. Did I kill him? Get out of here. No. Go. Go back to the city. I'll take care of everything here. Now go on. I should call the police. I'll do that. Go back to your daughter. She needs you. Nina? She's beside herself ever since you left. She's, she's been babbling about sea air and waves and, and oceans. She had me frantic with worry. Then I remembered the shack. Oh, thank the Lord I found you. 
Is he? Is Daniel? I'll take care of Daniel. Go, Max. Please go. Your daughter needs you. All right. I'll go. And Max, uh, when you get there, uh, Nina will probably be asleep. I had to give her a couple of pills to calm her down. Go on now. I'll take care of everything here. And, and I'll phone you. Yes. All right. I drove back with the uncanny accuracy of a man in shock. And when I reached the house, I parked the car expertly in front of it got out and went inside. Nina was in her room, lying on her bed, her face turned to the wall. My darling, oh my dear, can you hear me? I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Your father is so sorry. Your father is a fool. He loves you. Nina, Turn and face me, sweetheart. I, I want to tell you what a fool I've been. Nina. Nina. She stirred. A tiny tremor ran through her body. Very slowly she turned toward me till she lay on her back. And there, there, on her neck, on her pure white neck, I saw the crimson mark of a pair of hands. Then the phone rang. Yes? He's all right, Max. Daniel's all right. You're sure? I'm sure. Thank you. to the bed where my daughter lay. Her eyelids fluttered a little and her lips parted slightly. I bent over to kiss her sweet face and as I did so, I saw the bright red mark of a pair of hands on her throat slowly begin to fade. You don't believe this story? Very well. That's your business. But if you have ever been very deeply, really deeply in love, you know how the entire texture of life changed and how the two of you changed. Did you see... Two quite different people. If you have never been so deeply in love, what can I say? Except, I'm sorry. I'll be back shortly. How does our story end? What is the final outcome? Does the oddly matched pair join together and live out their lives in harmony and bliss? telepathically exchanging thoughts and feelings? I do not know. And to tell you the truth, I do not want to know. And neither, I think, should you. Our cast included Gordon Heath, Ralph Bell, Ann Williams, and Corin Orr. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Enjoy this episode of CBS Radio Mystery Theater. If you enjoyed this and want to hear more, please subscribe to this channel. You can also visit my other YouTube channel by searching Mr. Brian McCarthy in the YouTube search bar. Until then, thanks for listening.